everyone, it's Jack back again looking at more weird episodes of WWE TV from the WWE Network. I've already done one of these, check that out if you've missed it, that should be up on the channel now where I talk about a Smackdown episode from 2003 where the main event was Stephanie McMahon versus Albert. That's, that's the sort of level we're operating at here. But I thought for this one, if I'm really going to look at some of the weirdest episodes of WWE TV ever, I've got to go back to the source. And by the source, I mean Vince Russo. So without any further ado, it's May 10th, 1999 in Orlando, Florida for a wonderful episode of Monday Night Raw. And I believe that this is one of the weirdest Raw episodes of all time. Now, some of you will be thinking, hold on, Jack, we know what happened in 1999. WWE or WWF were turning the tide of the Monday Night War. They'd already started to win back the ratings. They were consistently kicking WCW's ass by this point. So surely the product was awesome. It was plain sailing until the war was won. And it, I mean, it was plain sailing, but was it good? Oh, let's dive in. The show opens with this shot of the corporate ministry, all the lads together, all the lads. There's quite a lot of them. I'm talking Triple H, Undertaker, Viscera, Paul Bearer, Midian, the, uh, the Acolytes, both of them, China, Shane McMahon in the middle there, of course, because he is the most important. And at this point in time, the corporate ministry was running wild, uh, mainly due to their numbers advantage, but also their pretty stacked lineup as well. Apparently only last week, they'd thrown both The Rock and Stone Cold Steve Austin off the stage. That's pretty scary stuff, but not as scary as this. Look at Triple H's jorts. Look at them. This is the 90s after all, but I mean, I was not expecting that. Hustle, loyalty, and what are those? <laughs> oh, when I wrote that, I was very proud of myself. And before we even cut to the arena, we are immediately introduced to the corporate ministry's big rival stable, the Union. Remember the Union? You might remember the Union. It's Vince McMahon, it's Mankind, it's Test, it's Big Show, it's Ken Shamrock, all with planks of wood. This is basically your dad and his mates going downtown to sort out the local hooligans. They've been in the park throwing the swings up over the, so the kids can't go on the swings and someone's got to sort it out. And that's, that's effectively the union. So now that we've established the main conflict of the day, uh, it's time to jump straight in with our first match of the evening. And this match features 1999 Babyface Kane, which is a very good thing because is this possibly the coolest Kane has ever looked? Maybe so, he looks awesome. He is facing the ass man himself, Billy Gunn, who is just at a peak. My gimmick is all about bottoms level right about now in 1999. Um, he's looking great as well, I've got to say, and he is the heel in this match because he is, he's, I don't think he's a member of the corporate ministry, but he is certainly still aligned for now with Triple H and China. And as I say, he looks great. So great, in fact, that when he reaches the bottom of the ramp, a fan runs over and she leaps into his arms and has to be dragged away by security. And it's obviously a plan. I don't want to put a dampener on like the magic of professional wrestling, but she is maybe one of the most obvious plans I've ever seen. And I'm not just saying that because she looks and is dressed like an attractive young actress who would be hired as an extra for such a role, but specifically because she looks and is dressed like Vince McMahon's idea of an attractive young actress who's been hired as an extra in this role. By which I mean, she is straight out of the 60s. I mean, look at what she's wearing. Look, look now, look. She looks like the girl from Wacky Races. This match is kind of one-way traffic. Like Kane beats up Billy Gunn for the best part of five minutes until Billy Gunn drop kicks Kane while he's stepping through the ropes to get back in the ring. And Kane gets his feet all kinds of tangled up in the bottom and middle ropes. We often talk about Kane and praise him these days for various aspects of his career, his look, his longevity, uh, his consistency, but we never really talk very much about his work rate. And I think that's a miscarriage of justice because this is like peak Shawn Michaels level stuff. Look at him. He can't even move. He's like a kitten. He's just helpless. Billy puts the boots to a trapped Kane who just cannot get free until he has to be saved by his tag partner X-Pac and Road Dog as well who run down to beat up Billy Gunn. And Road Dog doesn't even have shoes on. And I quite like that because this is the attitude era, guys. This is like um, there's been sort of chaos backstage and, and Road Dog's gone, hang on, he's getting beaten up, we've got to go and he didn't even have time to grab any sort of footwear. I think it's good. I think it gives the illusion of chaos backstage. Or because this was the Vince Russo era, maybe it just accurately reflects 
the chaos backstage. Road Dog brawls with Billy around the ring and he throws him over the crowd barricade. Now, Luke, who's editing this, please put in the screenshot of the crew member who nearly gets hit by Billy Gunn as he flies over his head into the crowd. That guy's adorable. Look at his cute little face. He's like, he nearly got hit, but I'm hiding down here all safe with my cables. D'Lo Brown and Mark Henry run along and they attack X-Pac while he's still trying to get Kane free. Then Kane does get free and Kane and X-Pac chase D'Lo and Mark Henry to the back and a thunderous chant of D'Lo sucks breaks out among the crowd in Orlando, Florida. Not popular down there, apparently. That, that's real heat for D'Lo Brown. So that's the opening segment, or that's the opening match, I guess, of the show. And that's a, a lot of stuff has already gone on. We've seen a lot of people, a lot of things have happened, lots of run-ins. The match didn't even have a finish. So this is sort of setting a precedent for what is to come. Uh, and I'm quite scared. For a brief second before the next segment, we see pro tennis player Monica Sellers in the crowd. She has no idea what's going on. And neither do I. <clears throat> Next up, hold on to your hats, everybody, because the dads have arrived. The union's quite horribly generic theme music hits, and here they come down to the ring, accompanied, curiously, by three helmeted security guards. And I'll be honest, when I first watched this, I thought one of them is blatantly stone cold. It's not, but that was my thought at the time. The reason for that is because despite being one of the most angry characters in the history of professional wrestling, you can't deny that Stone Cold has a bit of a playful side, uh, and that playful side manifests itself in the fact that he loves a disguise. He's basically our truth. Vince gets on the mic and calls out his son, because Shane's leading the corporate ministry. Vince is here. Vince also calls out Shane by his full name. He gets on the mic and goes, Shane McMahon, which I find a bit odd. Also, the idea of Vince McMahon leading a group called The Union. I mean, the irony writes itself, doesn't it? Vince and the union are interrupted by, of course, Shane McMahon and the corporate ministry. They come out onto the stage and Shane says, Vince, I don't need your family anymore. I've got my own family now. All these boys and China are my family now. All of them. And there's so many of them that Shane is about to head to the ring with his bigger gang and kick the union's ass. But they are interrupted by a mysterious voice playing over the speakers. They turn to the Titantron. Who could it be? Of course, it's Shawn Michaels in a tiny little green room, which is odd. But anyway, Shawn is the commissioner at the time. He would sometimes show up and then sometimes be absent. He was kind of our collective absentee father of the Attitude Era. Shawn gets right down to work, changing the booking. Uh, to reflect that he is a babyface and he wants to favor the babyfaces. So immediately he makes a change to the main event of the next pay-per-view that's coming up in a couple of weeks over the edge. He says that in the main event where Austin's defending the title against Undertaker, there will be an extra special guest referee because Shane's already the special guest referee. There's going to be some funny business. Sean doesn't want any of that. So he says Vince McMahon will be the other special guest referee. But predictably, because this is the Attitude Era and nothing, no stipulation goes untouched at the show itself, uh, Vince actually got injured in a beatdown by the corporate ministry on Heat, the pre-show, uh, in a match he was having against Midian. That, that actually happened. So that, that whole thing there that, that Sean has added is entirely pointless. But what isn't pointless is that he then says, I'm going to make loads of changes to this very show. This episode that we're watching right now, most of it was in kayfabe, booked by Shawn Michaels. Uh, it turns out that Shawn Michaels' idea of a good show is curiously similar to Vince Russo's idea of a good show. So much so, in fact, I'm talking like loads of stipulations, lots of gimmickry going on. So much so that I honestly think that Vince Russo likes to see Shawn Michaels as his like self-insert character in this world, which is really hilarious when you think about it. I'm not gonna mention every single match that Michaels books in this segment because we'll, we'll go on to see it later on in this video. Most of the matches on this Raw were in kayfabe, obviously booked by Sean. Uh, but one that is worth mentioning right now is Big Show versus Paul Bearer. Because when Michaels announces this, we cut back to the arena and Bearer has immediately fainted. There's not even a comedy beat. Like, we're looking at the Tron, we're looking at Michaels, he says, Big Show versus Paul Bearer. Bang, smash cut to Bearer, who's already unconscious like that. Look at him, <laughs> that's quality. Michaels also books the main event 
of tonight's show, which is going to be a huge six-man tag team match between Vince McMahon, Steve Austin, and The Rock, and the team of Shane McMahon, Undertaker, and Triple H. And Sean says, that is a huge main event I've just made, but who could possibly be the special guest referee in such a, a, a huge Titanic main event? Hmm, I wonder who could be the guest referee. At this point, Shane McMahon cuts Michaels off and says, yeah, we get it, Sean. You're lazing away there in San Antonio all safe from us, you big coward. And I'm thinking, could they telegraph this anymore. Sean says, look, Shane, I knew that you were going to react like this, okay? Uh, so that's why I want those three security guards with the helmets on to reveal themselves, to reveal who they are. Now, obviously, spoiler alert, one of those security guards is Shawn Michaels. We saw it coming a mile away. But what I want to know is, if Sean's in the ring and this is all pre-recorded, how did he know that Shane was going to interrupt him right when he did? It makes no sense. Anyway, the three guards are revealed to be Pat Patterson, Gerald Briscoe, and then obviously the third one is, is Shawn Michaels. He takes off the helmet and just immediately starts stripping off his clothes. Because he's Shawn Michaels, and that's just, that's just what he does. We go to commercial break, and when we come back, <laughs> it's obviously time for the Big Show versus Paul Bearer, match of the century. Now this, if cagematch.net is to be believed, is the only match that Paul Bearer ever had in... What's that song? It's Fire Engine. Now this, according to cagematch.net, is Paul Bearer's only ever match in WWE, or WWF at the time, obviously. And the stipulation is that if Undertaker tries to interfere, then he will lose his title shot at the pay-per-view. Sean kicks a very reluctant Paul Bearer down the ramp. He's like, get, get, go on, get in there, get in there and face this seven-foot man. Um, Bear is obviously terrified. At this point, Sean then goes on to commentary and just chills out with JR and Lawler. And the vibe that he gives off is very much like a teen movie party hoe. He's like Van Wilder or something. Like, he's just this cool guy who's just messing with the baby faces. He loves the ladies and he's here to make sure we all have a great time and occasionally will take his clothes off. The match begins. Big Show boots Bearer in the face, drops a standing elbow, and Bear is, <laughs> Bear is immediately unconscious. Like, he's already out. Big Show has the match won if he wants, but he doesn't want to win yet because this is the attitude era, nothing straightforward. Big Show gets on the mic and goes, Commissioner Michaels, sir. Michaels on commentary, very charmingly actually goes, yes, sir. Like he's very like attentive. He's like, oh, you're a baby face. I'm on your side, friend. Big Show says to Michaels, look, can we waive this little stipulation about how Undertaker's not allowed to come out here? Because I want him to get himself out here right now and I want to kick his ass. Michaels is like, if that's what you want, go for it. A Big Show is obviously an idiot. The reason that Big Show is an idiot is because here comes The Undertaker, but he's not alone. He brings out nearly all of the corporate ministry who all just start, just start beating up The Big Show. Thankfully for Big Show, he is saved before long by all the members of the union, apart from Vince, who, who run down with their planks of wood and chase away those ne'er-do-wells from out of town. They're just working men with their planks of wood. Working on the farm. Working men. <laughs> <laughs> what on earth am I talking about? Next up, another match that Michaels has booked. It's Deborah versus Sable in an evening gown match. For the title, obviously, this for the women's championship. As Deborah makes her entrance in her evening gown, Lawler on commentary turns to Shawn Michaels and says, Hey Shawn, I can't help but think right now that Deborah's gown would look good on the floor next to my bed or your bed. <laughs> Just like, Jerry, what are you talking about? Like, he so desperately wants to be Michaels' friend. He's like, oh, I think I want to get with her. Or you, or you could, mate. I'm not, I'm not going to stand in your way. Jerry, what are you doing? The match hasn't begun yet, or has it? Because it sort of has, because Val Venus comes out and starts flirting with Deborah because he's currently in a feud with Jeff Jarrett, who's with Deborah, and Val Venus wants to steal Deborah away because he loves her. He starts flirting with her from the outside of the ring. Deborah is fully distracted by this. Sable sneaks up behind, just rips off Deborah's evening gown, and that's it. The match is over. Title successfully defended. Well done, Sable. Um, I, I, I don't even know how to begin to analyze this. A young Michael Cole even then gets in the ring with the microphone and he's all next to Sable, like, well, Sable, congratulations, you've defended your title. I'm like, what? What is going on? Sable's henchwoman, Nicole Bass, chases Val Venus away uh, and then she gets back in the ring and so does Michaels. Michaels gets up from the desk and he gets in the ring too and says, hang on now one second, because my rules work differently around here, actually. And basically, Michaels' point is that Deborah is so hot that the fact that she lost her clothes first means that she should actually win the match 
And so Deborah wins the women's championship. There is a title change because she had an evening gown ripped off her. That's right up there with Becky Lynch beating Ronda Rousey at WrestleMania 35. Moving swiftly on, the next match is another HBK special. It's Big Boss Man versus Test in a nightstick on a pole match. Right at the start of the match, Test climbs up. He wants to get the nightstick so he can use it. Boss Man immediately pulls down the back of his trunks and we can see his bottom. We can see his bum bum. Why has the show got so much semi-nudity? They brawl for a while slowly in and around the ring and the crowd are kind of bored because everybody just wants to see the nightstick get involved. And eventually Tess does climb up. He grabs the nightstick. Now he can use it. Bossman pulls out a hidden stick and blasts Tess with it and wins shortly after. So the stipulation was pointless. Let's carry on with the show. Backstage we go where Val Venus is cutting a promo. I'm laughing already because this was bizarre. Val Venus is cutting a promo about how he hates Jeff Jarrett so much and he just really wants to steal his girlfriend. And Val Venus is meant to be this, obviously, like this kind of sleazy, but chilled out ladies man. Like, he, yeah, I'm Val Venus. You know, all the ladies want me. And he's so angry in this promo. It doesn't me like mesh with his character at all. He's like channeling Macho Man Randy Savage almost. Look at the veins in his head. That is real anger. We'll get that match later on in the show, but next up, it's another HBK match. It's a handicap hardcore match between Viscera and Midian of the Corporate Ministry and Mick Foley. Now, we saw Mick Foley as part of the union earlier. He was Mankind. He was fully dressed as Mankind. He was in his Mankind gimmick. But Michaels, when he booked this match, said, Cactus Jack, for one night only, he's going to wrestle this match. And here comes Foley, and he is. He's dressed as Cactus Jack. So I guess that Foley, quite charitably, just changes his gimmick whenever somebody asks. Foley comes out with two basketballs as his weapons of choice. And just kind of misses, <laughs> just kind of misses his opponents with them. But it was a novel idea, Mick. So well done for trying. This is about a three or four minute brawl with just various weapons. Um, there's not much to report. Foley gets the win with no assistance from anybody else. He beats Viscera Midian two on one with an elbow drop from the apron with a chair tucked underneath his arm. So. There we go. Michael's next match on the show is Farouk versus Bradshaw, but they're the acolytes and they're both in the corporate ministry together, so they're not happy about this. Also, it's a lumberjack match and all the lumberjacks are members of the union with their two by fours working on the farm. Foley comes back out to join the lumberjacks and he's gotten changed, so he's mankind once again. And at this point, I realize what a bad night the union are having. Like they're not winning the war against the corporate ministry at all. Foley just won. Fair enough, he's doing okay. But on the other hand, Test lost to Big Boss Man. And Big Show had to be saved from a beatdown in a match against Paul Bearer. So yeah, the union aren't doing great. Farouk gets on the mic and says, look, we're not going to fight for your entertainment. This is my pal. He's my stable mate as well. We're not going to do this. And even if we did, we all know who'd win. And then Bradshaw's like, oh, really? Well, <laughs> Bradshaw's not that playful. Bradshaw's all like, oh, well, how do you do? Because my name is John Bradshaw Layfield. Well, not yet. And I'm going to kick your ass instead. And Farouk's like, now, now, damn. I'm going to kick your ass instead. And they get right in each other's faces. Like, men. Such men. They do have a bit of a match, and obviously whenever one of them gets knocked outside the ring, the unions start beating them up a little bit and then throw them back in. Uh, until we get an ending I didn't expect to this match, conflict resolution. Because Boss Man, Viscera and Midian all run down, get in the ring and start talking to them like, guys, this isn't you, you know? I don't know what sort of tension you've got going on, but your best friend you shouldn't be doing. This is all assumed dialogue, but I, I think that was the gist of what they were saying. I'm not sure why, when Viscera and Midian just ran out, and Bossman, of course, as well, why the Union didn't immediately attack them. I thought this was like gang warfare. I thought it was on site, but they let them just run in the ring, and they just stood there with the planks of wood, just like, oh, it's... So two lads that Mick was fighting before. The corporate ministry do manage to calm this situation down and they all become friends again. And then the union realize, oh no, these are oh, our rivals. It's the guys we absolutely hate. They all get in the ring with their two by fours and all the corporate ministry members bail, apart from, apart from Visra, because he's too slow. And Visra, by the way, yeah, and rightly so, because he's surrounded on all sides. He's absolutely terrified, look at him. <laughs> It's weird seeing Viscera scared. Feels like seeing like someone you, who shouldn't be scared being scared. Feels like seeing your dad being scared, basically. That's how I think of it anyway. My dad's not Viscera. My dad's name is Graham. Viscera gets hit a bit with the, with the planks of wood and then he just gets out of the ring and kind of walks off. He doesn't sell it that well. He's like, ooh, a bit sore, but I'm all right, you know? Like four on one, 
but I'm doing okay. Next up, oh man. So Lewis House, who works here at Cultaholic and knows like a lot about, about the Attitude Era and just wrestling in general, told me that this was apparently, inexplicably, one of the highest rated segments in Raw history. Um, if that's the case, and that is true, what was everybody thinking in 1999? This match is a loser leaves the WWF match, booked by Shawn Michaels, a tag match between Patterson and Briscoe and two of the Mean Street Posse. I think it's Rodney and Pete Gass. Patterson and Briscoe make their entrance to Real American and they come out cupping their ears and ripping their shirts like Hulk Hogan. At first I thought this had to have been a dub because nobody pops when Real American hits. And even though, you know, this is 1999, I, I would have, almost guaranteed that some people would have popped when Hogan's music, oh my god, he's back. Anything can happen in the World Wrestling Federation after all. Nobody pops, they all just kind of go, <laughs> who's coming out to Hulk Hogan's bloody theme tune? I would have lost my mind. But it can't be a dub because Patterson and Briscoe are fully hot dogging and grandstanding. So I guess it, uh, I guess nobody cared about Hulk Hogan. I mean, I'm, I'm not that upset about it really. Patterson gets ambushed outside the ring, but Briscoe gets in, the match begins. Briscoe just starts battering these young lads. Like Briscoe's doing flat out haymakers to the face, but also mixing in some nimble amateur wrestling, grappling type takedowns and stuff. Briscoe thinks it's 1978 right now. Patterson comes in with a riot helmet, because he was one of the riot, remember they were the riot guys earlier with Michaels? Comes in with his riot helmet, lays them out with it. Absolutely. <laughs> Pigas and Rodney are getting really, really battered by these older men, let's say. They slap on stereo submissions, there's like a figure four and a Boston Crab. The Mean Street Posse tap out. Like, they're, we're out of this company. I know the stipulation says that we've got to leave, but this is too painful. I can't stand up to the might of Patterson and Briscoe. And they lose. And this is possibly the cleanest match finish of the entire night. Patterson proper goes for it as well. He celebrates, takes his top off, and he's all like, yes, I'm Pat Patterson. I won that fictional tournament in Rio, and you never did, so what can you say to me? Next up, Val Venus versus Jeff Jarrett. Now, apart from the opener, Billy Gunn versus Kane, this was the only non Shawn Michaels booked match of the show. In kayfabe, of course, all these matches were really, really Russo. But they have a really intense brawl, man. Like I talked about how angry Val Venus was earlier. Jarrett makes his entrance first. Val comes charging down the ramp. They start leathering each other on the ramp. I'm like, oh, let's go. Like, it's on. This is a real fight. It's not real, obviously, but they're both quite good, especially Jarrett. So it looks, it looks convincing. They have a, quite an intense brawl. Um, and and I'm just I'm just confused while it's going on because as far as I can tell the storyline is that Val Venus is the babyface, Jared's the heel, Jared's got Debra in his corner and he's with her but Val wants to steal her away and is angry because of that. Jared should be the angry one because Val wants to steal Debra away from him but Val's the angry one because he wants to steal her away. I can't work it out. They have the best match of the night, which is really boring for this video, obviously, but it's just very solid. Jarrett is an absolute pro, as we know. Val Venus holds up his end of the bargain as well. The finish is a little bit screwy, however. Val seems like he's got the match won. He gets on the top rope. He's about to come off the top, but then Deborah, like a modern day Miss Elizabeth, slinks onto the apron, and instead of removing her skirt to reveal a shorter skirt, like Elizabeth did, uh, she just takes her top off and waves it around her head. God, it feels like there were about 40 years between the 80s and the 90s in wrestling, and I don't know how. Val's obviously distracted. He goes over and like hugs Deborah over the ropes and starts like grinding a bit. Uh, do, do you think he'd like try and kiss her or something? But he's like, no, I'm just gonna grind on you, baby. And <laughs> Jarrett gets slipped the newly won women's championship by Deborah, uses that to clock Val when the referee's distracted. One, two, three, Jarrett wins. And I mean, it's the best match of the night. Still sub 10 minutes, um, but it was. It was good wrestling. Oh man, right, next it's a beaver cleavage vignette. So for those of you fortunate enough never to have heard of beaver cleavage, allow me to ruin your day. Remember Mosh from Mosh and Thrasher, the headbangers? So then Mosh decided he didn't want to be like a rocker anymore, like punk anymore. He wanted to be a schoolboy who fancies his mum. Hmm. So yeah, we'll, we'll leave that 
in 1999. We'll move on to the penultimate match of the night, Ken Shamrock versus China. Michael's booked this one, of course. Uh, he billed it as the most dangerous man in the world versus the most dangerous woman in the world. China comes to the ring with Triple H. Shamrock gets in the ring and the ref's like, let's go fight each other now. And Shamrock, before the match, had said, I was raised never to lay my hands on a woman, so I, I don't know if I can. And he can't, he gets in the ring and he's like, China, mate, I don't want to fight you, like, honestly. China is China. She's hard as balls. She just slaps him a few times, punches him in the head. Shamrock grabs her by the throat and then Triple H hits him from behind. That should be an immediate DQ, but it's not for some reason. Shamrock fights Triple H off and then turns and China's about to hit him again. So he grabs her and hits her belly to belly and then thinks, oh, what have I done? Like, I've, oh, I'm, I'm such a bad guy. And he gets out of the ring all angry and he kicks the ring steps and storms to the back. And that's the segment. And mercifully, it's time finally for the main event. Obviously, Shawn Michaels is the guest ref. It's a six-man tag. Austin, Rock and Vince, Shane, Triple H, and Taker. The heels make their owners first, and just look at the state of this trio, like when it comes up on screen now. Oh my God. It's, well, first of all, what is Shane wearing? Secondly, it's almost like when there's an indie wrestling tournament in PWG or somewhere, and it's the final day, and the only tournament match left is the final, so they've got to fill the card with just random tag teams thrown together. That's the, the chemistry I feel between all three of these men. The heels come out to no chance in hell. Shane's got that theme music now, so then when Vince makes his entrance, he comes out to total silence, like a heel Tommaso Ciampa. It's, oh, it's different. The Rock arrives, he's got an injured arm, he's got a cast on his arm. Uh, they start brawling on the ramp, uh, and I swear this happens. Every single Austin tag team match, this is how it begins. Because then Austin gets the glass shatter in the music. It does pop the crowd, it does work, but like it's every Austin tag match I can think of in the Attitude Era. Obviously, so he can come out and turn the tide and really take the fight to the heel team. And I get it. I, but I knew this was going to happen before it did. Undertaker doesn't care about Austin though. He's not messing about. He wants to win this match. Tombstone on Vince straight away. Taker then drags Vince outside the ring, starts wrapping a cable from ringside around his throat. Meanwhile, in the ring, The Rock just decks Shane McMahon with the arm with the cast on it. And I have to point out at this stage that Michaels is doing a stellar job of enforcing the rules as referee. At some point during this melee, Austin does arrive. Everyone's still brawling. There's a rock bottom on Triple H, but Undertaker like breaks up the pinfall. And I've noticed this is meant to be a tag, like a six man tag, but there's been no tags. I have no idea who the legal or illegal men are in the match. No one's even gotten on the apron at all. And honestly, on commentary, Jim Ross is having the time of his life. So I'm never gonna take him seriously again whenever he sneers about an AW referee not quite getting the rules right or oh, he's left the illegal man in the ring too long there. Jim, I saw you in 999. You didn't care about the rules then, my friend. You were buzzing because Austin was kicking ass, I assume, that's why. But Jim was having a ball. Austin ends up in the ring with Shane, hits the stunner, Shane's out, Vince gets on top for the pinfall, one, two. Austin breaks Vince's pinfall attempt, Shane gets stunned again, and Austin gets the pinfall for himself. So, I mean, the crowd are happy. Again, there are no tags to speak of. Tags? Who needs tags in a tag team match? JR doesn't care. Austin's like, yeah, give me some beers, beers and stuff. That's how the show ends, but like really abruptly, as if they were running out of time. And this whole match, with all the massive names involved, went like four minutes. So I'd feel a little bit shortchanged. This episode of Raw definitely fits the criteria of this series. Like a very weird episode, but also, a very rubbish episode. There were 10 matches on this show and Raw obviously wasn't three hours then. 10 matches is a lot and none of them went over 10 minutes. You had 10 really short matches, four of them ending in no contests of some description. Obviously the women's title changed hands via having an evening gown ripped off. Parson and Briscoe beat the Mean Street Posse totally clean and a clearly almost overrun main event as well. It was a real mishmash of stuff all jammed to get, it was textbook Vince Russo. At this point, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, what happened at the next pay-per-view, Over the Edge, but honestly, that was, you may know, the pay-per-view where Owen Hart tragically lost his life. So really, the match is pale in significance to how important that was you know, for Owen Hart. Um, but, you know, I'll run through them anyway. Uh, Kane and X-Pac retained the tag team titles. Val Venus teamed with Nicole Bass to beat Jeff Jarrett and Deborah. Billy Gunn beat Road Dogg. The Rock beat Triple H via DQ in the semi-main. And in the main event, The Undertaker won the title from Austin after a roll-up and a fast count from Shane McMahon. No, you know, like, it wasn't the most consequential pay-per-view of all time in terms of storylines and stuff. But yeah, obviously, the, the tragic event, it will always be remembered as, where Owen Hart sadly passed away. But back to this role in question, though. 
Um, the Attitude Era is very fondly remembered, and I totally get why. Like the electricity, the energy, the passion involves, you know, all the crazy characters on the roster doing all these crazy things. I totally understand. There was real momentum behind the WWF at this point, but this episode has aged awfully, and I suspect that might be the norm for Raws around this sort of time, in the Russo period. Um, I'm not a fan of Russo's style of booking, what can I say? I know it led to some great moments, but it was like throw everything at the wall, and eventually something will stick, but there's a lot of trash to get there. So, to give this video a little bit more of a point than, than usual, perhaps, uh, I would like to say, that we should appreciate a man named Chris Kresge more. Some wrestling fans, some people watching this video may have heard of him before. If you haven't, Chris Kresge was the man who became the head writer once Russo had left and gone to WCW. Um, Kresge was in charge, I believe, from the time Russo left until No Mercy 2000. So he wasn't a head writer for a very long time. He stayed on until 2002 and then sadly lost his life in 2005, so he's no longer with us. But there's really not that much about him out there apart from stories of, of how talented and clever a head writer he was. And I think there's evidence to back that up. If you look at this episode from 99, this Russo episode, and then you look at 2000, which is widely regarded as one of WWE's best years ever in their history, I think you have to attribute a lot of that to Chris Kresge. Apparently he would um, storyboard ideas and stuff backstage, he came up with some wonderful promos and that sort of thing involving Angle backstage, and basically gave us some of the most memorable and dramatic and compelling storylines we've ever seen. 2000 might not be the year we immediately jump to when we think of the Attitude Era, we think like the trash TV kind of stuff, but in terms of critical acclaim and the quality of what was going on at the time, then 2000 is really the year of the Attitude Era's pinnacle. Um, Chris Kresge, man, we need to give him his dues more, I think. Obviously, he's no longer with us, sadly, but I feel like he's not mentioned enough still. And that's it. Thank you very much for watching this episode. Please do leave your thoughts on future episodes I should look at on the old WWE Network. Maybe an Impact one here or there as well. There'll be a lot of that about one there. So, uh, yeah, just weird episodes of stuff, man. Um, I've really enjoyed doing this. If you have as well, drop a like on the video and all that kind of YouTube-y stuff. And have a good day. Uh, take care of yourselves and I'll see you very soon.